I don't shovel snow before Thanksgiving or after my birthday in March, but I changed it this year. I told Karen it's December 1st now, so I moved it a week. But uh, my son had eight inches down in Cleveland, and I told him I, I let God clean off my sidewalks. My sidewalks, I don't know about you folks, it sits in a way, it's angled, okay? And seriously, all my walks were cleared by what, one o'clock in the afternoon, right? So what you need to do is get the right sunshine. Yeah, that's right. Anyway, it's good. Uh, we're moving along in our, our study. We have two more of the apostles to do tonight. and. Um, we're going to get one done tonight, and hopefully we'll get the, the last one done next week. So anybody know which one we're going to do tonight? Simon. Very good. You guys are sharp. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 4. Matthew chapter 10, looking at verse 4 tonight. And we're going to flip over and see what he's mentioned a couple of times here. Matthew chapter 10, looking at verse 4. I hope in, in these studies on these guys, you know, that you learn more about who they are. They just uh, weren't random choices. God had a, a decision uh, on each one of these. It says in verse 4, Simon the Canaanite and Judas Iscariot, also who also betrayed him. So we, we see Simon described as the... Canaanite. Now, we look at this and we wonder what that might be, um, but when we look at it, we understand there's different areas in Israel, and it may be that uh, he was from one particular area, but that's not the name he would leave him with. Look at Luke chapter 6 and verse 15. Luke chapter 6. And look at verse... verse 15. We have Matthew, Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon called Zelotes. Also, we call that, uh, a little hot up here, Mike, the microphone, not me, but the, yeah, I got woo, woo, kind of going on here, but uh, there's a couple of root words here, and we don't get the benefit of that. We just read our scriptures. But if you go back and look at the, the Greek, um, the word here uh, has a, a Greek meaning to be jealous. So we think of someone who's zealous about something. There's a, a jealousness, and they had a jealousness about the law. And we'll get into more of these as we go through. In the Hebrew, the word simply means zealous. So we see to be jealous, uh, to be zealous, and uh, the words have a similarity in that when we are properly jealous of something, uh, we want to protect that and take care of that. There's a, a zealousness that's there. One more point, one more area we see him mentioned is over in Acts chapter 1 and verse 13. Acts chapter 1, look at verse 13. Acts 1. Verse 13, and when they were come in, they went up into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, the son of James, or Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon, Zelotes, and Judas, the brother of James. So we go through and we, we see these, and they're all listed that are there. By the way, was Judas Iscariot in the upper room after Christ's resurrection. Now, where was Judas? Probably in hell. Uh, unrepentant, uh, uh, unsaved person from everything that, that we know uh, was hanging on that tree. So it's careful to mention this was Judas, the son of, or the brother of James. So we, we see that over there, and uh, so we get the, the 11 that are listed in Acts chapter 1, Right, because one would be missing. So we see them in groups of four, four, and then three as we go through that. So the title, Simon the Zealot, uh, 
Muslims identify with a political party that was located in part of Judaism, part of the, the Israelites. And after becoming a follower of Christ, it appears that, you know, sometimes people that are zealous about one thing get zealous about a lot of things, right? They just carry it along. And we could use a little zealousness in Christianity today, by the way, a little excitement, right? A little bit that's there, that's right. So apparently when he came to be called by Christ, became one of the apostles, he became a follower of Christ, he tended to, from what we can tell in Scripture, probably continue to manifest that same kind of fierce, fiery passion that he had when he was a zealot. We need that fierce, fiery passion in Christians today to tell others. I was uh, noticing today I have next door on my, my phone, that's probably what's big all over the place, but anyway, uh, somebody received um, a salesperson, I guess, at their house and not only left them with the sales material, but also left them some Christian material. And this guy thought it was absolutely the worst thing in the world, how somebody could leave that kind of stuff, and he just would rant and rave and on and on. And it was funny because he said, good for that person, whoever it was, because that's what Christians are supposed to do. They're supposed to go into all the world and tell them, you know, there was no indication they forced anything, and just left them some literature to read, right? So there was somebody, a salesperson, that wasn't afraid to have zeal for Christ and leave something. What would most people have done? You're that salesperson, you're looking to sell them, I don't know if it was windows or what it might have been, but what would most salespeople probably do? Just leave it without the material they're selling. That's it. Yeah. Wouldn't say a word, wouldn't leave anything because they're fearful to offend, and they might not get the sale. But the Bible tells us to tell every creature, Amen. to tell everyone. God puts us in contact with people, and sometimes I wonder when we get to glory if we won't hear a little bit about, hey, you know, I put that person in your face and that person in your face, and what'd you do, right? Uh, we'll see. But uh, he retained the title. So even in the book of Acts, he still called Zelotes or a, a zealot. The zealousy Zealousness, jealousy, <laughs> zealotness. I don't know. I don't, any teachers in here today? Good. We'll just call it jealousy, okay? And uh, uh, we used to have a lady here. Her name was uh, Bev Tracy. Remember Bev? So you might remember Bev. And, and she'd sit back there, and you know, after service, she'd correct all my my poorly used English and everything. I, I said, Bev, maybe you need to come and preach, right? I'm grammatically challenged. Right? Uh -huh. Yeah, thank you, grandson. Appreciate that. Scripturally sound. Yeah, so I'll have some extra presents this year from Christmas, so it'll be good. So, we have the attitude, the mindset of someone that was excited and would stand firm for what they believed in. You, you just would have been called Simon, not Simon the Zealot, had it not been the case. So, we're going to look a little bit give you a little bit of an education tonight. There were basically four groups of, we'll call it, we'll call it political leaders, uh, for lack of anything else, that were in the, the Jewish nation in Israel. There were the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, and the Zealots, all right? Or Essens, as some people would call them. Uh, I prefer Essens, uh, what I would do. We're going to look at a, a brief history at these four dominant groups in Judaism and how they impacted the, the religious life and the social life and how Simon would have tied into some of this and what happened. We're going to see how Jesus dealt with three of these groups. There's four mentioned up there. Someone tell me which group Jesus never said anything about in his in the writings that we have. It's not just, it's the essence, right? The essence. Never mentioned 
uh, in the scriptures are mentioned uh, later uh, in, in another book. But uh, the, these four, the zealots, were the last of these four great political, I'll call them great by just size and number, not by uh, what they did, but uh, to emerge. They were the most fervent, the passionate, they were the patriots, they were the nationalists, right? They were the ones that, that knew that God's hand had been on the Israelites and they, they, they wanted nothing to change, they, that's what they wanted. Uh, and we'll look at that as we go through because they did some things that weren't very good as we look at this group of people, but they had a, a jealousy. In fact, the resistance uh, is traced back to a book. If you look over here, that's a 1611 replica King James Bible. Sitting in the middle of that Bible are a series of books called the Apocrypha. Why are those books in the Bible? They are historical books. They were located at the end, just like if you have a Bible and you have uh, a, con a table of contexts or things at the back, uh, historical information, you can go back and read that. That is not divinely inspired. That's the author, whoever did the, the commentary on the Bible, has done the research, put those things in there. It is not divinely inspired. It is not part of God's written word. We understand that. That's what the Apocrypha was, mostly written at the end of the book of Malachi uh, through the, the, the first century after Christ, uh, during that, that silent period, as we call it. So the Apocrypha was included in there. I'll give you a history lesson here as we go through. It was put in, how much of the New Testament was around when Christ was here? Zero, Zero right? There'd be none there. So we understand as the New Testament was being written uh, and those things, letters were being passed around, uh, it was uh, in the two, second, well, actually the one, two, third century AD when the church leaders came together over much prayer, over direction from God and determined the books of the Bible, there'd be 66 of those that would be there. In the late uh, third century, that's the 200s AD, the church began in some areas to waver. They began to support things like infant baptism. Uh, some idol worship came along. This reached its pinnacle when the universal church was formed shortly around 313 AD. The word universal, we have another term for that, and what is that? Catholic, Catholic okay. Catholic means universal. When Constantine saw the cross in the sky, in this he shall conquer, and went out and won the battle, he came back and declared that Christianity, oh, not the Christianity we know from the first century, but the Christianity that was half-baked in Rome at that time, where they were doing all kinds of, you know, baptizing babies and different stuff, so this thing was common, but in order to uh, be able to have, have a job or do things in the government, you had to profess yourself to be a Christian. How many people do you think profess themselves to be Christians? Everyone. Right? Right? Well, I'll be a Christian. I'll be a Christian. It's like the, 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 the boy that's dating this really pretty girl, and, and she says, are you a Christian? Are you? Yep, I am too. Right? <laughs> yeah, I'll be a Christian. If you're a Christian, I'll be one of those things. And so we have the history of the church going through that time, and then the the Catholic church begins that universal church, and everything under the... the the auspices of Constantine and then others and bishops and popes and all the stuff that would come along after that. So they, in the, uh, the writings, as the New Testament was written, they demanded that the Apocrypha stay within the Bible. So as Jerome was redoing the Bible for the Catholic Church, you would have the Old Testament, you would have the Apocrypha, and after that you'd put the New Testament. So why wasn't it taken out in 1611? I'm glad you asked the question, okay? Because in 1611, when King James authored, and I've heard people say, well, King James was an awful man. Yeah, he was. Do we understand today that King James was not a part of translating the Bible into English? 
He didn't come in and sit down and help the boys do that, right? He simply said this, I will give you permission to do it. First of all, you will name it after me. And second of all, you must include the Apocrypha in the Bible that you translate. That's why the 1611 replica Bible has the King James, or has the Apocrypha sitting in the middle of it. It was in the 1700s, I believe around 1735, that if you ever come up and try and read this Bible, it's difficult to read. Yes. An F is now an S. So when people tell you, well, you don't use the 1611 King James Bible, to a certain extent, they're, they're right. But what we do use is the authorized version, a better way to put it. The authorized version which said those 66 books and the words that they're, they're written from the, uh, the original source in, in the Hebrew, in the Greek, in the Aramaic, translated, is what God's word is. We have that? So that became the authorized version. So somebody says, what do you use? I use the authorized version of the Bible. Because in 1735, uh, they corrected some of those letters, and so now the F is an S, so we can read it in our English today and not the, the old English. That was changed. There were some uh, uh, changes with punctuation and things that were uh, caught up in the Bible, so it is indeed true. We don't use that Bible right there in its writing form, but we do use it in its translation form. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. Okay. That's why we use that. And that's why uh, I, you know, I don't go into your homes and find out what Bibles you use and things, but it's why we use that book because up until 1952, it was really the only Bible that was used in America. And if you go back and trace American history, you'll find all kinds of revivals going on. 1952 came the revised version, and then uh, later on in the early 70s would be the, uh, uh, the, the revised standard version. In other words, the revised version wasn't good enough, so we did a revised standard version. Shouldn't that send a thought in your head? I'm a little bit off track here a little bit, but stay with me, because this is important stuff to get, right? If we have to update the Word of God, then do we have the Word of God? I write a letter to my bride, right? And Tim sees it, and he begins correcting things, takes out some words, changes some words and different things, and then gives it to my bride. Is it the same letter? No. 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 So they've been changed. There's 10,000 words that have been eliminated in the NIV from that Bible right there, right? So we know those changes that occurred from the authorized version. In the NIV, of course, uh, theirs wasn't, well, actually, they lost their... Uh, their patent. Most of you are aware of that. They lost the patent on the NIV. It wore, so what'd they do? They came out with an NNIV, right? A, a, or a RNIV, a revised version of the scriptures. Always good to do this. Stay with the authorized version. And if there's things you don't use, understand, we have plenty of tools to help you do that. And by the way, those these and thous and yees are in there to differentiate between plural. If I do this, if I say you, who did I just speak to? Did I? Oh, was I just speaking to Tim? I said you. You, it, it could be singular or plural. See, in our English language, we have a problem with that, right? But it's the, uh, the, the, when I say ye, it's plural, right? And the, that's plural, so we understand speaking to everybody, you know? Ye folks, right? That means everybody. So different that are there, I'll, I'll get back to this, but I just wanted to share that because in, in 1 Maccabees 2.50, I don't know if I've ever quoted a book of the, uh, the through here, so I want to get that straight, all right? Be ye zealous for the law and give your lives for the covenant. Maccabees, a, a military book is really what that is and it was speaking apparently about the zealots who would give their lives for the law the law of God was it and they would give their, their lives for that a politically oriented group known as the zealots let's do this let's take a couple minutes because we have some time 
Can we do that? Yes. And let's look at some of the different groups that Jesus came up against, because it all kind of filters down, and we can see where it goes. First of all, there are the Pharisees. The most important of the, the four that were there, the Pharisees, they were the kind of the, the, the spiritual fathers of modern Judaism. Can anybody tell me when the Pharisees as a group seemed to disappear? When the Pharisees as a group of leaders disappeared. 73 A.D. Don't ruin it. That's right. 73 A.D. Interesting, we think they're still going, but actually that different leadership that's there now, their main distinguishing characteristics were a belief in the oral law that God gave to Moses at Mount Sinai, right? Along with the Torah. So the Torah, or the written law, was similar to our, our U.S. Constitution, how you're supposed to live. So they were, they were tied right into those things in a sense that the, uh, uh, the, the series of laws were open to some interpretation, uh, just as our Supreme Court would interpret things. But they believe that, that God gave Moses the knowledge to share exactly what those laws meant and how they should be applied. So they took the, uh, the oral tradition that was there and they, they codified it, made it into law, and wrote it down roughly three centuries later, and that became their marching orders. And what we know now is the Talmud, right? But they, they also maintained there was an afterlife existence, right? And that God would punish the wicked. He would reward uh, the righteous in the world to come. They, they believed that there was a Messiah that would be coming. These are the, the Pharisees. They were, in essence, I guess you could say, the, the, the blue-collar Jews who adhered to the tenets of the law. So people would come to, what does the law say about this? What does the law say about that? And they, they, would, they would do that. And uh, they believed that uh, uh, such things, such as individual prayer, assembly, and synagogues were all uh, very important. And they would influence the common people. If there was one group that Jesus took off after of these four groups, which ones was it? Pharisees. The Pharisees. Why? Why would he go after them more than the Sadducees, more than, well, than the Essens at all, or the Zealots? Why? Tim. You're close. You're close. They didn't recognize Jesus. Number one. They didn't recognize him, but why this group? Because all of them had the same problem. They hated people. I, I said the word already. They influenced who? Common the common people. These were the ones that had the greatest impact on the common people. Jesus came for the common people. And so the battle between the Pharisees and and their father in John 8, 44 is who? Jesus told him, you are of your father, the devil, right? That was the battle. The battleground was who Jesus was to the common people. And so by keep taking people and keeping them strictly under the law, what they would miss is the spirit of the law. Remember, constantly Jesus would, he would do miracles on what day of the week? Sabbath, why? What was he trying to do? Trying to show them that the, that the spirit of the law is above the letter of the law, right? That if there's someone who needs help, you go help them. You take care of them. And so it's very important. By the way, there are religions today that still stay very fast to the law. I'll give you a few reasons why they were, first of all, they were jealous of Jesus. 
Jesus was popular among the people. He had a large following of people that would follow him, hundreds of people that would follow him wherever he would win, he, he, wherever he would go, I should say. <laughs> Sorry, Mrs. Tracy. And, that follow him wherever he would, he would go. <laughs> and they were envious of this popularity. They wanted to be the popular folks to the common people that were out there, right? They wanted to be the ones. That, so they were jealous of Jesus. He attracted huge crowds. People loved him. On the other hand, the Pharisees were filled with, with, with judgment and harshness, coming down on people. You know, if you have a choice in life, do you want somebody who's harsh or do you want somebody who's nice? Most of us want nice, right? Yeah, I do. Second of all, not only was, were they jealous, but there was the exposure because Jesus exposed the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. Hypocrites. Hypocrites. Right? Whited sepulchers. Dead men's bones. I mean, they talk about preachers. I've had people say, well, you don't preach very nice sometimes. Go read what Jesus did. Yeah. Good night. I mean, <laughs> he just kind of rip snorted on some of these people. He tore them apart. He didn't care who was around. He just called them, what do we call it? Call a spade a spade? I don't know if you can still say that anymore, but uh, uh, whatever we do, but, but we do that. It was the Pharisees who set the moral standards for the community. They were the ones who wanted to be most honored and, and celebrated in their titles and, the, and their virtue and all that they did, but their virtue is nothing but pretense. So we have the, uh, the whited sepulchers or whitewashed tombs filled with dead men's bones. Number three, they were a threat to the Pharisees' power yes. because they couldn't control the people. Right. Jesus came, look at, you know, when Jesus was talking to, to uh, uh, who was the, the, the guy that sent uh, point, Pilate, right? Pilate, yeah, Pilate. You know, he asked him about him being a king and, you know, his kingdom is not of, of this world yet, Right? But they were, they were jealous. They thought he would come. He would take over. They'd lose all their power. Power over the people. You know what people want? They want power over people. Right? I was asked that by a gentleman one time. How it felt to have power over the people in the church. I said, buddy, you need to come to church sometime, okay? <laughs> I don't know what church you're thinking of, but it's not this one here, okay? Trust me. Turn to Matthew chapter 12. We're not going to spend a lot of time on this, but we'll look at a few verses because he just hammers these boys. Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. Here we go. And at that time, Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn, and his disciples were at hunger and began to pluck the ears of corn and to eat. Do you think that was an accident? No. No. But when the Pharisees saw it, now I got a question. What in the world are the Pharisees doing out in the cornfields? <laughs> I mean, did you ever just stop and think, read your scriptures in depth, and sometimes what, what are they doing? They I mean, following Jesus to see what he was doing. <laughs> that's exactly what they would do out there. You know something? I would offer them some corn. You boys hungry? You've been following us around, right? You know, that's one of the corniest stories in Scripture that we have here. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, the, thy disciples and that do that which is not lawful to do unto the Sabbath day. But, but he said unto them, Have you not read what David did when he was in hunger and that they were with him? Remember, he went to the priests, and uh, he'll go through that. He, he speaks about that. You can go through, well, take the time tonight, read Matthew 12, read Matthew 13, read Matthew 16, read Matthew 19, read Matthew 21. Go through all these scriptures. It's just attacks. Because as Jesus is getting ready to the point where he will give his life a ransom for us, he wanted the common folks to see the reality of false religion and the truth of what he offered. Amen. I get taken to the cleaners sometimes because I'll talk about a different religion in a negative way. I want to tell you, any religion 
that does not put Christ at the head as the only one, as the way, the truth, and the life, does it not profess salvation by the scriptural standards that are given, is a false church. Amen. Plain and simple. It's a cult. It's, a cult. it's simply a cult. You say, well, I don't like that. They do nice things. A lot of, there's a lot of nice people in hell. It's not niceness. By the way, there's some nasty people in heaven too, by the way, right? And uh, so it's putting your faith and trust in Christ. That's it. Confessing that sin and doing that. The Pharisees had it all wrong. Hey, not only Paul, how about Nicodemus? Yeah. John chapter 3. How about a man named Joseph of Arimathea? Yeah. By the way, when they were going to bury Jesus, where did they bury him? In the tomb of who? A Pharisee. Yes. Right. And Nicodemus was there to help. You see, there were Pharisees that realized the truth. Right. And that's why... When you speak to someone that's of a, 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 a cult, we'll call it, and put it that direction, it's up, it, it behooves us to tell them the truth about Christ. Yes. Nicodemus came to Jesus by night. He didn't understand what salvation is. And Jesus said, you must be born again. And what did he say? Can I crawl back into my mother's womb? Right? He says, you, you, aren't you a teacher? Right? Don't you understand this? And he, he went through. And, of course, we, we go through John chapter 3 and read that entire context. I think of the Apostle Paul when he met Jesus on the road to Damascus, right? The Pharisees. Then we come to another group called the Sadducees. Anybody know why they were sad, you see? Something they didn't believe in. They didn't believe in the resurrection. They did not believe in the resurrection of, of Christ. They were a sect that again existed History shows us, just like the Pharisees came about during the second temple phase, and then in 73 AD, something happened. We'll get to that in a little bit. And this group just seemed to vanish. Oh, there were probably still Sadducees around, the Pharisees around, but their, their position, their title, all that they had, they were scattered. So we'll see that, but they were the, the religious side of the Jewish leadership. They controlled the temple, and they controlled the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was the uh, kind of the combined governing body of the Jews, which had some Sadducees, had Pharisees in it, scribes in it. Uh, how many were in the, the Sanhedrin? Uh, one less than 72. There were 71. 71. Very good, 71. They were known for their conservative views, and often they went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Pharisees. They didn't get along with each other. They, they went more, a little more conservative on things uh, and saw a little bit more of the spiritual side, but over here the, the Pharisees were more of the legal, they were the legalists. But now they had a common enemy who was Jesus. And now they come together and now they become friends and strike out to kill Jesus. They tried to trick Jesus with some questions. Turn over to Matthew 22. We don't have a lot of points where these folks are by themselves. But Matthew chapter 22, they tried to trick, trick Jesus with, with questions. And, and what Jesus would simply do, and by the way, it's something we ought to do, use the scripture as your argument base. Stop saying, this is what I think, and this is what I believe, and this is what I, I, I. It doesn't matter what you think and what you believe. It's what the scriptures say. Now, hopefully, what you think and what you believe lines up with the scriptures, right? But thus saith the Lord. How many times is that in the Bible? This is what God's word says. This is what we're supposed to do. We need to know the scriptures, study the scriptures to show thyself approved unto God, right? A workman needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's our call. That's what we're supposed to do. We ought to know the book. So when somebody comes up and says, well, what about this? Well, let's look that up and see what God has to say about that, right? So Matthew chapter 22, look at verse 23. The same day came to him the Sadducees, which say there is no resurrection, and ask him, saying, Master, 
Moses said, if a man die having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed upon, unto his brother. Now there were with us seven brethren, and the first, when he had married a wife, deceased, and having no issue, left his wife unto his brother. Likewise, the second also, and the third unto the seventh. You know, it takes a lot of time to come up with these kind of thinking, right? <laughs> unto the seventh and last of, the, uh, of all the woman died also. Well, good. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. Hmm. Jesus answered and said unto them, You do err, not knowing the scriptures. I love that verse. Memorize it. People say, this is what the Bible says. You do err, not knowing the scriptures. Right? Yeah. The air, the, you do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. Stop there and think about that. Who were these guys? These were the religious leaders. Yes. These were the guys that were supposed to know the scriptures, right? I mean, if you're going to come and, and, and you have a, a biblical question, wouldn't it make sense that you can come and talk to your pastor about that question? I would hope so. I tell you what, if I don't know, we'll sit down and open the scriptures and we'll find the answer, right? These guys didn't know. They were so into their power. He says, for in the resurrection, see, doesn't know the power of God. So in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as angels of God in heaven. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have you not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying... I am the God of Abraham, of God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the multitude had heard this, they were astonished at his doctrine. Now here come the Pharisees. But when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they gathered together. They were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. And this is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? They said unto him, the, the, the son of David. He saith unto them, how then doth David in spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said unto him, My Lord, sit thou on my right hand, till I make thine enemies thy footstool. But David then called him Lord, how is he his son? So he, he comes back at the Sadducees, at the Pharisees. These were folks that did not believe in the resurrection. They didn't understand the scriptures. They didn't understand not only the legal part, they didn't understand the, the spiritual side of the scriptures. These were the elitists. You know, the hooty tooty guys, right? That, that had it all, and, and they were the priestly castes. They were very liberal in their willingness to incorporate Hellenistic, the, the worldly philosophies, into things that they did. They, uh, they didn't believe in an afterlife, they didn't believe in the resurrection, they didn't believe in any of these things. How would you like to go to one of those people for your religious questions? So what happens after we die? <laughs> just you done. Die. You die, you're dead. So why should I live for God if I just die? Right? That would be a good question back, right? So Jesus comes after the, the, the Sadducees. He's coming after the Pharisees. We have another group here. They're called the Essence. And they began around the seven, second temple period also, and they basically emerged out of the disgust with the other two. You know, they just said, you know something? You guys are awful, okay? So they started their own little group, right? You see it, Pharisees, Sadducees, now the essence come in, and this sect believed that others had corrupted the city and corrupted the temple. They moved out of Jerusalem and lived a monastic life in the desert, and by a certain Sea that was located in Israel called 
The Dead Sea, that's right. The Dead Sea, right? They moved out, they lived there, and they adopted a, just like all of us Baptists, a strict dietary law. If it's food, we eat it, right? right. Pretty much. They're a commitment to celibacy. I put a few pictures up here. I hope you can see these. This is over by the, the Dead Sea. Not a lot known about these folks. We were able to go there. Um, this one of the houses they would have lived in. You see, very small, very simple. If you notice, they're all dressed in white. They took baths constantly throughout the day before they would handle the word of God. And before Rome was, or the Romans would invade Jerusalem in 70 AD, what these folks would do is they would take the scriptures, they would take the law, they would take it out by the Dead Sea, up in the mountains, and they would put those in little jars and in caves, right, and preserve those in case someone, that's how much they loved the, the Bible, the law, okay, is they wanted to preserve it, make sure it was right. They believed in a life of celibacy, uh, which often wonders why we have a picture of kids in their house. But anyway, um, we see it, and, and they're all dressed in white because that's what, what they wore. They constantly wash their hands, uh, they constantly kept themselves clean whenever touching these things. Along comes 1947. 1947 comes along and a, and, and a Bedouin. Anybody know what a Bedouin is? It's not really going to sweep at night. A nomad. They wander around and that's what they do. And a, a young Bedouin, and he was out doing what young Bedouins do, throwing rocks, right? All those rocks in the desert, aren't they there to be thrown? No. Takes a rock and throws it. <coughs> what was that? That boy walked into that little cave right there, looked in, and uh, he had thrown a rock and it had broken one of the jars is what he had done. He went back and told others, you see, there was a, a large, remember, after 73 AD, when Jerusalem is basically done, and Masada is done, all those things are done, all of a sudden, everything just kind of scatters. They forgot where they put it. It's like squirrels. You know squirrels forget where they put 95% of the nuts that they bury? Yes. They dig up their whole yard and they don't know where they put any of them, okay? They all have dementia. They all don't know what the squirrel's problem is. They act squirrely is what they do. So we, we, we see them here. They, they, they went up there. They found these. And we call those today what? Dead, dead the Dead Sea Scrolls. They began going through the Dead Sea Scrolls. They went through the, uh, what, in our English went back to the, uh, the Hebrew and the Aramaic that the Old Testament was written in. They found exact, these were exact replicas because when they translate or they copied the scriptures, they had folks that would copy them meticulously. They would count the number of marks on a page frontwards and backwards and it had to exactly match and they would share it with others, and if it didn't match, it was destroyed, and they would start over again. These were the, these were the essence. You know, here's a group of people that, that few know anything about, but think of their impact on our world today. If it hadn't been for them. It hadn't been for them. We've never had the Dead Sea Scrolls. At least, I guess God would have made a way they would have had them, but think about that a little unknown group of people that were good folks that wanted to preserve God's word. And that's what they did. 70 AD, what happened in Jerusalem? Rome invades. Because we get to the zealots. Members of a Jewish sect noted for their uncompromising opposition to pagan Rome and the polytheistic religion that they had. They were an aggressive political party. I believe you ought to stand up for what's right. I, for one, do not believe that violence is a way to achieve that, right? There are times, oh, well, what about the Revolutionary War? I think that was a last ditch effort that had to be done. But, you know, when Christians go along and become violent people, we kind of lose our testimony, don't we? Yeah. They were an aggressive group. Nationalistic, religious life of the Jewish people 
led them to despise even Jews who went along with the Roman way of life. We understand that there was a census ordered in Rome in, in 6 AD, and the zealots were so upset with that, they rallied the populace against the nation of Rome, and uh, it had to be put down from time to time. There were extremists within this group, became known as the uh, Sicarii, uh, the dagger men. They would go out, they would murder others, they would murder Romans, they would murder Jews who were going along in Roman ways. I, I, I think here for a second of a Jew that uh, was a, a tax collector for Rome. Matthew. And here is the zealot, now one of the 12, and there's a Roman former tax collector. You talk about God making all, old, all the old things pass away and all things become new. What a pairing of people. A zealot over here realized that he needed to have zealousy for Christ and accept anyone for who they were. By the way, that's what church ought to do, right? Accept people. The extremists would follow them. They murdered, plundered, burned, looted everything. And in 70 AD, when the Jews, the Romans came, their major problem was with the, the zealots, but they came along and they destroyed Jerusalem, set it on fire, along with 985 towns in Israel. There was a group of these zealots who survived under the leadership of of a man named Eleazar, and they left and they went to a place called Masada. I don't know if I have more pictures. I may have some more of Masada. Uh, a, a, a place that was actually used as a sanctuary by the king's uh, vacation place. If you have Verbo or one of those places, they'd probably have it on there and have $7 after it. Right? Seven dollar signs. Expensive. It was empty. They went there and they they, they, they go and they're, they're trying to escape for three years. From 70 AD to 73 AD, they, they would be there on Masada. But then the Romans finally find a way to get up that mountain. What do the zealots do before the Romans get there? 960 of them commit suicide. Their leader convinced them, wasn't Jim Jones and David Koresh weren't the first ones, convinces them it's better to kill yourselves, your wives and your children, than turn yourself over to Rome. Would you say that's a corrupt power? But that's who he was. 960 Jews died. Three survived. A woman and two of her children hid in the caves. They were the only three survivors. They weren't found by the Romans, but they survived Masada and were able to go back into Jerusalem and tell the folks what happened at Masada. We were hoping to go there when we were uh, uh, in Israel. We weren't, we weren't able to. So we see the four groups. Now, let's just keep going. We've got a couple more minutes. Simon attached himself to this group with that tremendous power that God can give. He was zealous. He was excited. He had a passion for what was right. God's still seeking that today. Yes. To have a passion for what's right. He was, he was transformed. I read a story. I see a violin sitting up there. And I'll put this story in its perspective. It's, it comes from many, many years ago. We have a violinist in here. And one of the great violinists of the day rented out an entire theater and told them that uh, he was going to uh, give a concert on a $20,000 violin. 
At that point, $20,000 was a lot. Just take that probably times seven today, right? Uh, a $20,000 violin. He comes out, he performs a beautiful, beautiful concert with that violin. When he gets done, he takes the violin, throws it on the floor, and begins to stomp all over this thing. The people are just like, oh, mortified. He walks up, pounds off the stage and goes. The stage manager walks out. He says, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you, first of all, that was not the $20,000 violin. That was the $20 violin. He's going to come back out. He came back out and played another concert with the $20,000 violin, and people saw really no difference between the two. He said, I had a point to prove, and the point is this. It's not the violinist that makes the music. It's not the violin that makes the music. It's the violinist that makes the music. You know, it's God who takes us, his children, his redeemed, and we're the ones that make the music, folks. We're the ones that God uses. He doesn't care if you're worth 20 bucks or if you're $20,000. He doesn't care. Simon had a very questionable background. Jesus didn't care. He brought him in. He trained him. And he would be zealous for Christ until his dying day. I believe every one of us ought to take a look, not about what we are or where we're at, but what can God do with us? Can we be that $20 violin that God can use for great things? Can we be excited? Can we be challenged to be zealous as he was zealous and live for Christ? Most of us, by the way, we are $20 violins, aren't we? Yeah. yeah. Eh, not a lot of $20,000 violins out there. Most of us are the $20. That's all we are. Sinners saved by grace. Amen. Amen. Let's stand. We'll be dismissed. Father, thank you tonight for your precious word. Even though this man is only mentioned three times in the scriptures, we can learn from his heritage we can learn from the history that you give us so much about him. A man with a passion, a man with a, an excitement, a man with a cause. And Lord, may we leave here today the same way, ready to tell anyone that Jesus is the way. Go with us now as we leave. Keep us safe as we travel. In Christ's name, amen. Are dismissed.